One of my goals before Jesus comes is to get some of you to say amen or church and be vocal at church and live this. All right, not you, Brother Mitchell. We know where you when you're here and when you're gone. <laughs> I'll tell you that right. I'm glad you're here. I, I get, uh, listen, it's okay to say amen at church. That's right. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. So some of you are like, well, pastor, well, pastor. You know, see, we're, we're, we, are, we are these refined Baptists. And I got a feeling we're going to get to heaven and uh, some of that refined Baptist side will be out the window. It's going to be out the window. He's with Jesus Christ. So on this side of heaven, we can, have, we can have a little bit of rejoicing in Jesus Christ. There's some churches when they say give glory to God, the whole congregation just erupts in applause. I'm not saying we do that, but I mean, it's not all bad to, to give glory to Jesus Christ and just show those things. So, so don't get scared on me. Okay, just understand that, that I'm not afraid for us to say amen and, and to show a little bit of emotion at church about, about our Savior Jesus Christ and God of the universe. All right, maybe a little Bapticostal. All right, I don't know. <laughs> Boy, now, now seem you're like, Pastor, you are nothing but a compromiser. All right? I can handle that. I decided I would probably never be that cool pastor. All right? You probably, you, I, I would, I mean, you know, listen, I wear a suit and tie to church. I'm not coming in jeans, cut off jeans, and, and, and a T-shirt or tank top. If I, if I do, you ought to probably walk out the back door because something's happened to me. And um, I tell you, I just, uh, I, I, the coming of God is too close. For us to stand by watching and to play church. We can't play church. Play, can't play godliness. We gotta be real and worship the God of the universe. We're gonna be in Isaiah chapter 19. I'm just getting warmed up for tonight. I apologize now. I apologize now for the service. I'm telling you right now. But I, so, Isaiah chapter 19, let me give you that. Well, I got two things I wanna talk about first. We can get to Isaiah chapter 19. First is this. So we come into the fall. I am excited about, I'm excited about hitting the fall. Many of you know I go on vacation. On vacation, I often think of things and plan and look at the church and new ideas. And this vacation was no, was no different than other vacations, all right? And so as we move to the fall, I've got some new ideas that I'll share when we come along. Nothing crazy, though for some of you, anything different is crazy. All right, and <laughs> I man, you're like, oh my goodness, did you, you know, did, did you, did you, did you turn the, did, you know, did you turn something around or something? So, I may even like change up the service order sometimes. Wouldn't it be crazy if I preached first one night or one morning? Some of you wouldn't know what to do with yourselves. You'd be like, no, I gotta stand up. You'd stand up halfway through my sermon. All right, and start to pull out money, and about 15 minutes in, you know, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. But so some of those things can be helpful to us. I'm not going to change or just do something just to be different or weird, but sometimes it's good just to, just to be shaken up just a little bit. Just to be reminded that we're not just here in, in a ritualistic tradition, okay? Now, we have order and structure to services, and that's good and healthy. All right, but I don't want to just get so rigid uh, that we get, well, this is church, and this doesn't have, this is not church. And so, you know, don't be, you know, just, just work with me along the way, okay? And, and have an open mind as we worship the Lord together. I'm not changing Bibles, I'll tell you that. I'm not changing, like, what I'm wearing at church. I'm not going to be that cool, Pastor, I'll tell you that. Other thing is this. If you're in here Sunday mornings, I'm going to ask for some help Sunday mornings. Uh, this morning, it was noticed again, like, they were having a number of visitors come to church. And many of you are faithful, committed unbelievably strong back row Baptists. I have encouraged you to move around the auditorium. And some, a, a, a remnant, a few do that. For some, your movement is sliding three inches to the left. And you're like, I didn't look at that pastor, I did that. So Sunday morning, we have visitors come and, and the back of the auditorium is packed. It is hard for a visitor to have to come all the way to the front. Can, can we at least understand that, that concept? And so um, I, may, I may ask that we reserve a few spots. And I don't want visitors in the dead last pew. So, so some of you in the dead back pew will be safe from this. And uh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. But listen, there's still front seats open. So for, if, this were, if this were a sporting event, you'd be clamoring for these front row seats. But some of you are just coming to worship God, so you sit in the back and like, well, I hope no one notices me. That's shame, shameful, shameful. So... But um, what I will ask, though, so Sunday mornings, Sunday mornings that we may, I may put a few reserve signs out on the end of some pews so that when a visiting couple or, or, or family or man or woman comes in late, we can slide them in easily. All right, so if you come and see something that says reserved, um, just understand that's what that is for on a Sunday morning. And then along with that, 
I would love to have four or five families, individuals, who'd be willing to be ready to, to receive a visitor when they come to church. All right, and so maybe you'd sit in a certain spot, we'll know where you're at, and then as people come in, um, Brother Robertson stands in the back, does a great job for us. I asked him to stand back there, and he, and he helps people, because this can be intimidating when someone walks into church, especially a church this size, and like, well, where do I sit? If they didn't know any better, and they probably don't, they think there's all assigned seating, and there is, because you all sit in your assigned seats, okay? So where are they going to sit? Well, Brother Robertson sits back there and helps get them to the right spot, but uh, I'd love to have four or five uh, couples, families, individuals, so that when a visitor comes in, they come maybe a young couple, we can slide them right into a young couple, and you're alerted and, and ready to go so that, hey, you interact with them and help them have a positive time here, experience, hopefully pave the way for the gospel, Right, that, that's, that's the key. So just some things as we, as we hit the fall, and, um, and this morning I was reminded we were, we were uh, full back there. There are, again, still some open pews up front. And uh, if any of you are dying to have those, I'll give them to you at a great price. Great price. Uh, reduced rate. Uh, and they can be season tickets. Uh, so <laughs> Isaiah chapter 19 tonight. Isaiah chapter 19. As we come into Isaiah, uh, if you're going to use the Bible in the pew, and I hope you use the Bible, uh, have your Bible either on the phone or in front of you uh, in a hard written form, or use the Bible in the pew, it'll be page 841 with the Bible in the pew, eight, eight, page 841. As we are inside of the series in Isaiah, uh, I believe one of the major emphases that God has for First Baptist Church is that we would grow in our knowledge of God. The theme that I'm presenting for Isaiah is that God is, help me if you remember, way up here, and we are way down here. And the God who is way up here reaches down to those who are way down here. He sends his son, Jesus Christ. He makes a way of salvation those way down here. But, but don't be confused that just because God has done that does not mean that we are like him and he is like us. God is, God is up here in his power, in his majesty, in his glory, in, in his will, and everything he does, he is above mankind. But I believe that, that one of the reasons God would have us be in Isaiah, with some chapters and some texts that are, are quite frankly, more difficult to process. Right, Isaiah chapter 19 will be no one's life chapter. You know, what, what chapter is really challenging the Bible? Oh, Pastor, Isaiah chapter 19. When God really talks about the burden of Egypt, man, that just, I mean, I have it on my wall in my house. No, I want to preach out of my funeral. No, no, no. But, but no less impactful if we gather the truth. And, and I will begin many of these messages this similar way so that we get what God wants for us. And that is we are supposed to know God. Not just know about God, but to know God and who he is. Our view of God should not just be the sum of our experiences. For many people... And sadly to say, for a, I can't say majority, for, for a number of Christians, their view of God is merely a sum of their experiences. If they grew up in a Christian home and were blessed in that way, then often they have not, inter, or sometimes have not internalized it, they just view God as they were taught, or a sum of their experiences. Perhaps they had prayed for something, and in their limited scope, and perspective, they didn't perceive God to have answered that prayer request. And then they determined, as a sum of their experiences, that God does not listen to prayer and, and answer prayer. To many, unsaved, God is merely a sum of their experiences. They knew a Christian. Perhaps a Christian was a faithful Christian, and they think, oh, then God seems to be a good God. Or they knew a Christian, and, and the Christian was a deadbeat, and a hypocrite, and a liar, and deceitful. And they walk away from any, wanting to know anything else about God because their view of God is the sum of their experiences. And my friends, God, and our view of God, is, cannot be just a sum of our experiences. Though as we experience God, it will broaden our perspective God cannot be just a sum of what we experience, but truly a belief that is founded in and upon his very word. For it is in this book that he will describe, and he describes himself to us on every single page. Every page will declare God to mankind through experiences, through characteristics, through praise, through defeat, 
of his people. Through sinful choices and through blessing, God is described to us. And God desires that we know him, that we learn of him, not just about him, but of him, that we interact with him, and that we acknowledge him in our ways, and that we appreciate or praise God in the grandness of his majesty and glory, clearly seen in nature, demonstrated in our lives, and in the lives of others, so that our experiences do not define God, but merely point to the God that we know intimately and deeply. In Isaiah chapter 19, we will come, in the first words, we will come and see that God is now going to speak to a land that throughout Scripture is known to be pagan. It's Egypt. Often Egypt is determined as a type of the world. That when we rely upon Egypt, in a sense we're relying upon an old path, old bondage, old sin. And Scripture brings us that, uh, that picture. But here in Isaiah chapter 19, we're going to see some things that God will describe of himself and of Egypt. So that when we walk away from the night, my prayer, my aim, is that we know God just a little bit more. That we don't just sit through another service and, and hear something and maybe glean something, but that we know God a little bit more. And that in your life as a Christian, tonight and tomorrow this week, that you will know God more intimately and more fully that you'll experience him, so that you can, with the psalmist, with David, say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and I am blessed because I've trusted in him. What is the best thing that has ever happened to you? Now, the right answer is God. That's the right answer. But let's just... Set aside that answer for a second because that's not always the answer that we believe. For some, it's, well, the day I became a mom or a dad, well, that was the best day of my life. Now, that was a wonderful day. I'm very blessed to have some children. The Bible says children are a heritage of the Lord. I'm blessed, but that cannot be the best day of my life. For some, and a paid ministry position, they would say, well, today I came to this church or, or became a pastor of a church. I'm very blessed to pastor a wonderful church like First Baptist Church. Very blessed. I'm blessed that I can point my children to so many examples of godly men and women of all ages, of all occupations, and so you can follow them like they follow Jesus Christ. But the day I became pastor, the day I became on staff here at First Baptist Church was not the best day of my life, nor should it be. It's not the day you retire. It's not the day you get married. It's not the day you get the promotion or the bonus or the thing you've been wanting. The best day of our life, what the best thing that has ever happened to us ought to be God. And so with that in mind, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into Isaiah chapter 19. And walk away, Lord, with a little bit more knowledge about God. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that tonight you'd help us. Uh, Lord, I need you as I try to articulate and, and from your word share some truths that you've helped me see in my study. But Lord, your spirit has to work in and among us in this service. Lord, I ask that you would bind the devil and his demons, that nothing would distract or hinder your word. In our minds, in our hearts, that they'd be free from distraction as well burdens, cares, concerns, would just for a few moments be put on mute. Lord, I pray that tonight you would show more of yourself to us. Lord, so we could walk away just knowing you a little bit more and a little bit better. Lord, I pray that you would touch us and change us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. In this passage, in verse number one, the Bible says this, the burden of Egypt, behold the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud. 
and shall come into Egypt. Now, for a moment, pretend that you are a class. All right? And here's the question. According to our text, who is coming into Egypt? You can look at it. It's open book. It's open book. All right? What does it say? Who is coming? Who? The Lord. Now, in your Bible, do you notice that it, for many of you, that Lord will be all caps? Do you see that? Small caps, all caps. When you see that in your Bible, understand that that is the name of God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the sacred, holy name of God. So there's no, uh, there is no um, duplicity uh, and there is no confusion in this about who is coming, who is coming into Egypt. In this coming judgment, it is not just uh, perhaps someone on a whim, but this is God himself who's going to come in Egypt. And, and look at your text. How was he coming into Egypt? Look at it. All right, it's right there. Not hard to find. All right, now say it aloud. How is he coming to Egypt? On a cloud. Swift on a cloud. Now, I just want to pause on verse number one and just want to, to point out something to you. That as this, as this judgment opens up, we are introduced not first to the judgment of God, but to God himself. Remember my point that, that I want us to know God a little bit better? So as we come into the, the judgment of Egypt, we're going to find out that, that God is not happy with Egypt. We'll find out why he's not happy, and then what will take place and what he'll do to kind of knock it down a few notches. But we find out it's God, and we find out something about God that is riding upon a swift cloud. Right? This is not just some filler on the page. Right? This is not just, hey, let me just describe God, and uh, oh, he's going to be on a swift cloud. This references... Back to Psalm chapter 18, where it talks about God, he rode upon a cherub and did fly, yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. All right, there is, there is God who flies. Now, now, just bear with me for a moment and think about what we try to do in society compared to who God is. And if you take a moment to think, you may understand that in our society, with all our technology, we can't even touch the might and majesty of God. And our technology, though helpful to us, in a sense, in a broad sense, tries to enable us to become more like a God. All right, God is not hindered by gravity, but you and I are. If we were to fly upon a cloud, we would have to get into a airplane or a balloon or some other device all right, we could not naturally or unnaturally fly. Superman is not real. So we could not do that. But God is not bound by the same laws that we are bound by. And understand in technology, God, all right, knows everything. Man in technology wants to gain knowledge. And now... We have a small piece of technology that helps you gain more knowledge called Google. All right? But still, with all our Google, we don't know a speck of what God knows. With all our advanced technology to get off the ground, we cannot, we cannot even come close to being where God is or moving like God moves. Because in our best efforts, we are still frail and small and way down here. And the, the passage opens just reminding us, giving us a visual picture that in this burden, in, in this judgment, God, the Lord, Jehovah, he is the one that is coming in, and the picture is he's riding a swift cloud in. The idea is that it is coming very, very, very rapidly. The idea is that he is just storming in. He is flying in. He is coming in right now to make this happen. And so in a sense, we see God's majesty on display inside of the burden of Egypt. My friends, God's majesty is always on display. Everywhere we look, we ought to see the majesty of God, not only in the answers to prayer and the blessings and the comfort and the encouragement, but even in times of judgment, we still see the majesty of God. So first we see the majesty of God on display, but then the next few verses, and we'll look at verses 2 through 10, 
number 2 through verse number 10, where the glory of Egypt is decimated. All right? And so we could say it this way, while the glory of God is exalted in verse number 1, and in the end, I'll point out, it'll be exalted one more time, in the middle there, the glory of Egypt, this false glory, this human glory, is decimated. Now, what do we normally see? We normally see human glory. Normally, human glory is exalted. We just spent some time in the Summer Olympics where human feats were elevated. And I'm not saying we should not appreciate someone who can, who can perhaps uh, train and perform some feat. But understand, in comparison, God's glory to anything mankind does, it is just a shadow. If I can say not even a shadow of God's glory. And so verses 2 through 10, we're going to, if we can read that, and I will point out some things and emphasize some words and phrases as you read, and I think you kind of pick up the thought that, that Egypt's glory is being decimated. All right, we'll start in verse number one. The burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. Remember the idols of Egypt. We're going to come back there. And the heart of Egypt, the heart of Egypt was strength. Egypt was a powerhouse. Egypt was a worldwide dominating force. Egypt feared no one. And yet here the Bible says when God comes, that their heart, their strength, their confidence will melt. Verse number two. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. And they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst of thereof. And I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the idols, to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits and to the wizards, and the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and the waters shall fail from the sea. And the rivers shall be wasted and dried up, and they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither, the paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brooks shall lament, and they that spread the nets upon the water shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax and they that weave networks shall be confounded. And they shall be broken in the purposes thereof, all that make sluices and ponds for fish. I'd like to stop there for just a moment. The next few verses just re reiterate those concepts. That the glory and strength of Egypt is going to be decimated. Or if we were to kind of dissect this passage, we would find out if we knew Egypt's culture and Egypt's background, that Egypt was known for and trusted in a number of things. Number one, Egypt was known for their idols. They were known for their idols. Egypt was the land of the gods. They had a god for practically everything. The god of the river, the god of the land, the god of the sun. In fact, Pharaoh was considered in their religion a god as well. It was the land of idols. There were false gods, and they worshipped everything. Now remember, God is way up here. He's the one who wants to be worshipped. He is a jealous God. Egypt is not worshipping God, but worshipping everything else that man has done. And so God comes in, God himself, on a swift cloud, swiftly, and he is going to, he is going to remove, decimate all of the things all of the items, all of the idols, all of the strength that the Egyptians have claimed for confidence. The water and the god of the water will be decimated. Their livelihood, the fish and fishing, decimated. It talks about the council and the wizards. 
And if you were to study the Egyptian culture, you would find out that they viewed, or one of the views of their idols was that their idols would give them special wisdom. And the reason that they could conquer other nations and other lands and have victory was because their idols gave these magicians, all right, these charlatans, special wisdom and, and, and knowledge and counsel. And God says, when I come in, I will also remove all of your counselors so that you will be reduced to nothing. You will have no strength in your idols. You will have no strength in your knowledge and your wisdom. You will have no strength in your livelihood. You will not even have any strength in your heart. Your heart will melt. Everything that you trust in, everything that you depend upon, everything that you've found your fortitude and your success in, God says, I will utterly decimate. I will just wipe it off the face of the earth. You'll be reduced to nothing and only able to see the Lord Jehovah. Right? So God in his majesty is not coming in and saying, listen, I am sick and tired of you. I'm going to wipe you off. He's saying, listen, I'm going to remove those things that you've trusted in, what you've depended upon, the things that were false and counterfeit, that were inferior. All of those things, your false deities, I'm going to show are just weak piles of dirt. Their strength will be shown to be weakness. Their glory is going to be shown to be worthless. They can't find wisdom. They can't find counsel. Their country is in shambles. Remember this. Anytime that we trust in something other than God, we're looking at a counterfeit. This is just a side note in this passage for you and for I, because my friends, I'm afraid that we're still guilty of looking at false charlatan, deceitful, counterfeit idols. Here's the truth, and we're going to connect some dots tonight. The Egyptians already knew about God. Want to know how? Abraham went there. Abraham went to Egypt, and he talked about the true God. This other little-known Bible character by the name of Joseph. Remember Joseph? He went to Egypt. He went there and he prophesied and told about some type of fam famine where there's another time in history when all the crops by the rivers, just like this one, would dry up. Joseph was there that, that, that day. And, and beyond that, then, then Israel and the other 11 sons came. All right, 11 brothers came. They came to Egypt. And for 430 years, God's chosen people were in Egypt. Egypt already knew about God. You, you can't tell me they didn't know in their, in their history, in their culture, with all their, their seeking of knowledge, that, that, that they would not have known about the God of the universe. Beyond that, when Israel left Egypt, the ten plagues, every single one, I have a whole list here, and for sake of time I can't share it all, every single plague was in a direct connection to one of their gods. Every single plague that God did was merely God, if I can say it this way, passively, aggressively showing that he is God and that God's not God. And not so passive, it was quite, quite aggressive, actually. Like, oh, you trust in the, the God of the, the Nile? Then your Nile becomes blood. Oh, you like the God of the frogs? Then have all the gods of frogs that you can possibly handle. You like that. Oh, lies, darkness, all these things. Just a direct bam, like this. So Egypt knew about God. Beyond that, story's not over yet. Once Israel leaves Egypt, the armies follow after children of Israel. Remember the Red Sea? What happens at the Red Sea? Every soldier in that army was killed. They all died in the Red Sea. That means that there were thousands, thousands of people back in Egypt who never saw a loved one again. Dad, Brother, son, husband, neighbor, friend. In direct revelation of the God of the universe is a lot better than your little gods, your little puny counterfeits. You know who else went to Egypt? Jesus. Jesus went down to Egypt. Egypt knew about God. And God says, I'm coming swiftly. 
I'm coming quickly. You see, anytime we worship a counterfeit God, life will come to shambles. And don't think that Christian, just because you have known God and you know God, that you can't be guilty of worshiping a false God. The minute you place your confidence in anything other than God, Jehovah, you are now worshiping a counterfeit God. If you find more strength in your friend's words than God's word, you are worshiping the counterfeit idol of your friends. Anytime you follow a false god, your life will turn to shambles just like the Egyptians. If you find stability when the bank account is full and anxiety when it's empty, as opposed to having, having a full confidence in God, then you're worshiping the God of, of the dollar. And heaven help us, because the dollar is not secure. We should know better. We have the Bible. We have the past. And yet we still reflect upon gods of our own design. We still process life based on what we can see. And that's the most devious God of all. Well, pastor, it just makes sense to me. In that moment, we are worshiping the God of ourself. Isn't that the lie in the Garden of Eden? Eve, you can be like God. You can be God. Just make your own decisions. Just elevate yourself above the God of the universe. And God says here, anytime to Egypt, when you do this, it will turn to shambles. It was just a house of cards. Here's what's amazing. I did a little study on how long Egypt was a superpower. Three days. Three days. In God's time. Oh, three, I'm sorry, 3,000 years on a human scale. I'm sorry, 3,000 years. Man, my bad, my bad. I, I, you know, see, if I say 3,000 years, you'd be like, wow, that's a really long time. That's a big dynasty. But for God, it's only three days. We look at it and say, wow, man, but they, they, they worship these gods for thousands of years. Wow, they prospered and built pyramids. This is 3,000 years. God's like, it's three days. They got away with it for three days. That's what the Bible says, uh, Peter, and in Psalms, uh, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He says it both ways to make sure you figure it out. So three days, three days God, God let them worship a counterfeit God. Three days. Not so long, is it? You see, we look around and say, boy, or boy my, my goodness, how can those people worship this way and the false God and still prosper? They've got just a few seconds. In a few seconds, just a moment. For what is life? It is even a vapor, which appeareth for a moment and vanisheth away. You see, as we learn about God, we find out he comes in swiftly in his majesty. We learn about Egypt. We ought to be reminded that false gods still don't work. They didn't work for the Egyptians, and they won't work for you or for me. And if it's our kids, if it's our job, if it's our money, if it's ourselves, we cannot be misguided to trust in anything but in God. Now, all of you tonight, I believe, would say, Pastor, I trust in God. But I wonder if we flip that around, but would God say you trust in God? Well, I'm glad that you profess that. I'm glad that you would announce that, but would God say, yes, my child, you trust in me? Because God does make that determination. Remember when he comes in, as we come to Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, that we find out that these all died in faith, the, 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 the chapter on faith, where God made a pronouncement, and he said, no, no, these people actually trusted in me. And these witnesses stand in contrast to all those around them who actually put their confidence in the God of the universe who rides in on a swift cloud, who came after Egypt, and who still loves us, who is still God, and who is still majestic. We can still trust him, but would God say, would God say that we trust in him? Would he say we have a heart that manifests him? Or is it just our own profession? We find one of the little thing in this passage that I think is particularly helpful to us tonight. 
It comes at the end of the chapter. And the phrasing of the, this verse is a little bit odd at first. Because the word that will be used is not one that we would anticipate with what follows. We are knowing, we are understanding that God is majestic and glorified, and we understand that Egypt is going to be cut down. And it, it was. But in verse number 22, and the Lord shall smite Egypt. Now pause right there. When we say the Lord shall smite, or if I say, I want you to you know, smite someone, do we think that is positive or negative? Help me. Right? Negative. You don't say, hey, you know what? I love you so much, I just want to smite you. Especially like biblically, like oh, with, a, with, a, with a Bible smiting. No, no, no. We, we think of a negative, like, like you're going to clean their clock. And especially with what we just read, when God says, I'm going to knock down your idols, I'm going to make your rivers to dry up, and you're, you, you can't even fish, you can't catch anything, the nets come back empty, all the crops by the water, where we're supposed to be fertile ground, will be dried up and withered away, everything is down, you're going to be under a cruel Lord and a taskmaster, your, your confidence in your heart is gone, your idols are gone, and I'm going to smite you. And it kind of fits in that context, does it not? Like, that's right, Lord's going to smite them. Bam, and just, there we go, you're done. But notice what he says here in verse 22. And the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and what? Heal it. Oh, come on now. Isn't that a surprise? Lord, I'm going to smite it. I'm going to smite you, but I'm smiting you to heal you. I am not smiting Egypt to crush it. I am not smiting it to snuff it out but to heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord. Now this, now let's go into a full circle on this. Remember how the Bible often equates Egypt with the world? The Lord judges wrong. He will not let, let false idols, counterfeit idols stand. The Lord will be glorified and, and, and magnified. He is majestic. But in this, he is not with Egypt coming to just destroy them, but to lovingly bring them back to him. His hand of judgment here is not a hand of cruelty, but a, but a kind hand of rebuke for repentance. And aren't you glad to know a little bit more about God that, that when God even in judgment, God is still a good God. This caught me, this verse. It caught me off guard, first of all. Here I am studying this passage, and I'm reading the judgments, and, and I anticipate the smiting of Egypt, and I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, wait, what? Like, yeah, God's going to smite them, and boom, and, then, and, and heal it? And then I read this, and this touched my heart. There's a man who recently, in the last, when I say recently, the last few, few decades, so maybe 20, 25 years, was speaking to a few Egyptian Christians. You know, Egypt is not gone. You realize that? Egypt's not gone. It is not the glory that it once was because God decimated it. But it's not, but, but, but it's not gone. There are other civilizations that are gone. Egypt's not gone. And so this man, Christian, went to Egypt and met with some Egyptian Christians. And he asked them about Isaiah chapter 19 and the judgment on Egypt to those men and women who are living there who claim the name of Jesus Christ and love the word of God. He asked, he said, you know, since the days of the Old Testament prophets, many of the prophecies of, about Egypt have been fulfilled. The glory of the pharaohs is long gone, and Egypt is not as powerful as it once was. And as the prophets have foretold, Egypt became a home of rebellion and eternal conflicts. And it still is, is it not? Brother against brother, in a sense, city against city, just like the Bible says. And just as Egypt will be smitten, as he said, he'll, he also promised that she will be healed. Christians said, we hold on to this promise and continue to pray 
for our nation. And he said this, this country, speaking of Egypt, probably deserved greater damnation in the past. But Jesus came to earth for that very reason. And he showed us that there is such a thing as grace. And then the man said this, thanks to the prophet Isaiah, we know this to be true. That at some point, they will turn to the Lord. They will turn to God. And so we plead with him for this coming. And we praise him for what he will do. This is the God we serve. So tonight, I hope you know a little bit more about God. With this challenge, if there's a counterfeit God in your life, it will turn your life to shambles. You may be able to hold on to it for a few seconds of life. It may be for your full life, or even for three days like the Egyptians. But false gods always crumble. They're always revealed for what they are, just wood, hay, stubble, dust, nothingness. But know this, that God up here is not looking just to smack you upside the head. He does smite sometimes, but his smiting is for the purpose of bringing back healing. And he wants us just to place our confidence, our simple faith in the God of the universe who doesn't need an airplane to travel, who doesn't need Google to know everything, and doesn't need a cell phone to contact, who knows it all, sees it all, and we can pray. That's the God we serve.